You are listening to DecayMag.com, founder and editor, Ken Otoos, exclusive interview with Stan Yan, writer and illustrator. There's a zombie in the basement. My name is Ken Artuz, founder and editor for DKMag.com. Joining me is Stan Yan, writer, illustrator, and instructor based in Denver. Yan's art is notable for his emphasis on zombie themes. In fact, you can see some of Yan's art on Instagram at zombiecature. Aside from his artwork, Yan is an independent publisher. Uh, he has published The Wang. His upcoming release, There's a Zombie in the Basement, is a book inspired by his son's fears of his artwork. Thank you for joining me, Mr. Yan. Well, thanks for having me. Well, for the first question, uh, every artist has his or her personal niche. What attracts you mostly to creating zombie-inspired artwork? Well, you know... I don't even know if there's an easy question for that. I mean, the uh, I mean, I've always been fascinated with zombies. Uh, probably uh, back to uh, when my wife bought me a PlayStation Two for Christmas and uh, uh, the Resident Evil Two video game. And um, but as far as me doing um, zombie artwork, that probably stemmed a little bit more from. Um, me getting into doing zombie caricatures of people. Um, you know, I've always felt like I've had the capacity to draw caricatures of people, but uh, never really the desire. And then one day at a, uh, a convention that I was working, it was a fantasy art convention with a bunch of my, uh, the, the other comic artists from my group. Uh, one of the guys was uh, doing fantasy caricatures of people uh, on an easel. And unfortunately, on, on Saturday night of that convention, he um, he got arrested for public intoxication. <laughs> so on uh, Sunday morning, no one was working the easel. And I was like, you know what? It's a shame no one's using it. Maybe I'll give it a shot. And uh, so I, I needed to work up some samples of uh, how my art would look since all the samples that were up there were his. And so I started drawing zombie versions of uh, people that were working the booth with me. And because uh, I figured, well, you know, no one's going to complain about, uh, um, you know, not looking pretty enough. They, they all expect to look pretty heinous if I'm drawing in the zombies. And uh, it really kind of took off. And that was uh, about 11 years ago. And, uh, and it's just, you know, gained in uh, momentum and uh, has become really probably, you know, mostly what I'm known for, um, doing zombie characters at, at uh, comic conventions and other events. And uh, this year, actually, I, I've gotten hired to do my first zombie wedding. <laughs> A zombie wedding? How does that work? Yeah. Well, I don't know that the wedding is, is going to be zombie-themed, but uh, I've been hired to draw the wedding guests as zombies. So I'll be on site, and instead of doing characters of people, I will be drawing them as uh, living corpses. <laughs> wow. Based on, on what you have just uh, disclosed, seems like fate kind of puts you on this path uh, on, a, on a kind of some other guy's uh, intoxication. <laughs> Comic Con, I, I just had a backpack full of my own self-published comic book, and I was 
trading people in the uh, uh, small press and independent press areas, and uh, one of the people that happened to agree to trade with me was Robert Kirkman. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah, and it was it was such a great book. It was irreverent. It had zombies in it. it uh, you know, basically checked all the boxes for things that I loved, and uh, um, and Tony Moore's artwork was phenomenal. And uh, so I was like, you know, the next thing that these guys come out with, I'm definitely checking out. And the next thing that did come out was The Walking Dead. And uh, so I was like, okay, I'll pick up issue number one, give it a shot. I liked it. And it was actually, you know, I, I typically hate serialized comic books. And uh, um, this was the first book that I had a comic book store ever um, uh, put on my pull list. I, I never had a pull list before this. And uh, so I've been following that. And then, you know, more recently, uh, Outcast. But those are two of the very few books that uh, I've had subscriptions to. Um, jumping ahead, there's this we on topic. Uh, all of the books that are, that you put out are published independently. Uh, what are the ups and downs of going through that venture? Well, I mean, I've never really uh, been interested in, in jumping through hoops and going through submission processes. I mean, not, not to say that I haven't, but I'm probably not as diligent as I should be. <laughs> For me, I'm I'm so into um, getting feedback from readers and, and fans and things like that. Whenever I come out with a book, I don't have a lot of patience, and, and as a result, most of the stuff that I've uh, worked on, uh, I end up uh, self-publishing. So for this particular project, the children's book, um, I actually did join the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is an organization that really is focused on helping creators to figure out how to get their foot in the door uh, with trade publishers. And so um, I actually spent about a year and a half submitting my manuscript for this book to publishers, um, just so I understood the process of it. But this project was a very personal project of mine. and. I, I had already been showing people this book at conventions. So while I was sitting there drawing zombie characters, and then I had a, um, a dummy manuscript that looked like a real hardcover book, but the pages were printed off of my inkjet printer, and it was just put together with, uh, you know, spray mount and glue sticks and things like that. And, and uh, so while I'm drawing them, they're reading this book, and and I, I had people asking me how to buy it, even and not realizing that only three of the pages were fully finished and in color and the rest of them were all just black and white sketches. So that in and of itself made me feel pretty good. But that was also a way that I was able to populate uh, my email list. So when I got around to kickstarting this project or if it were to go ahead and, and get you know published by a trade publisher, I could notify everyone how to get a copy of the book. And... Uh, so I promoted it for about a year before, in, in that fashion before I ever got around to uh, um, getting all of my rejection letters back from uh, these publishers, which were fantastic. I mean, number one, if they send you a rejection letter in the first place, then that's very nice of them to take the time out of their day to do that. But on top of that, um, almost every single letter that I got was very detailed with, uh, you know, critiques and feedback about, you know, how to make my work, um, you know, more suitable for them as publishers. And uh, so it, it was very flattering to me because uh, for most of the people in the industry that I've talked to, they don't, they don't normally uh, write personal uh, letters like that to people that they're rejecting. <laughs> so, so between these two things, that gave me a lot of confidence. And, and so when I got around to running a Kickstarter for this book, um, I was I was very confident that uh, I could get it funded, and get this book produced, and, and uh, um, you know, it, that it would meet its goals and everything like that. And, uh, um, you know, the book has been out now officially for about, what was it, three months? few months or so and just uh, between the books that I pre-sold through the Kickstarter
Carter and the books that um, I've sold at events um, because this is really I haven't done the hard release. I'm, I'm trying to make my official uh, book release, you know, before Halloween here. But um, yeah, I've already gone through half of my initial print run, which is a thousand books. So <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that right now without, you know, a whole lot of promotion, so to speak. So you're, you're a part of kind of my initial hard uh, hard book release. <laughs> right, right. I'm uh, happy to uh, oblige in any way we can, especially, you know, since it's independently published and it's an indie product, you know, we stand by independent uh, horror mediums. 100%, because guys like you, that it's going to push the genre even further into the future, whether it be children's books, films, video games, uh, you, you're the next step, the next generation. Well, I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, in your latest book, uh, There's a Zombie in the Basement, it's set to release September 10th. 2016 right. hardcover. Uh -huh. Okay, you provided a true to life scenario that many readers can adapt to. Uh, can you share some insight on the development and inspiration that led to this creation? Right. Um, well, before the creation of the book, I, I really had no desire to, you know, write or illustrate a children's book. Um, you know, I've, I've had family members badger me about it, but, you know, you, you kind of have to. I mean, any anything that uh, you create, whether it be comics, uh, children's books, novels, you know, you need to be really inspired um, before you you can do it. Otherwise, you know, in my opinion, it, it kind of shows up in in your work. But um, so for me, my my inspiration was for my son. Um, he he's now uh, six years old, but at that time, he was about uh, he wasn't quite four years old. And uh, one day, he just would not come down to my uh, basement studio. Uh, that's where uh, where my office is. And uh, his mom asked him, what's wrong? And he told, told her, I'm scared. And uh, when uh, she asked him what he was scared of, he started pointing at all of the uh, zombie artwork that was hanging off my walls. And um, ever since she was even pregnant, she had been trying to encourage me to you know, change out my decor of my office to make it a little bit more kid friendly because she was afraid that, uh, you know, he would be scared and he wouldn't be able to sleep. And, uh, yeah, I was more of the opinion that, uh, you know, the scarier the things that kids are exposed to, uh, the less, the, the more desensitized they'll be to it and the more well adjusted. Because some of the kids that, I've met that, you know, had parents that ran haunted houses, that made the animatronic, you know, um, Halloween de decorations. They were some of the, you know, most mild-mannered, well-adjusted kids I've ever met. But uh, um, this kind of proved that uh, I guess I was wrong about that. <laughs> so he was scared of my artwork, but instead of consoling him, I spent the next hour writing the manuscript for this book. And, uh, you know, some two years later, uh, you know, this, this is when it's finally out. And I'd like to, you know, just say for the record, once I created that uh, dummy manuscript that I'd been taking around to all these conventions to, to let people read, um, you know, I brought it up to show my wife. It was a, you know, beautiful hardcover book looking thing. And, uh, you know, it was 11 o'clock at night. I figured there's no way that my son is still awake. But lo and behold, I get up there. He is awake. He sees what's in my hand. He's like, Dad, read me that. Read me that. And, uh, of course, my wife has, has given me that look again. And she's like, well, all right, if you can't fall asleep after this, you're the one that gets to stay up with him. So I, uh, I read the book to him. Um he seemed to be pretty happy. I, I said, did you like it? And he said, yeah. And then he just rolled over and went to sleep. So I'm like, yes. So I, <laughs> I was like literally doing fist bump, uh, pumps, you know, saying it worked, it worked. And, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, last year at the Denver Comic Con, um, with a, a little bit of help from me, he actually wrote and illustrated his own uh, zombie comic book. 
and sold it at my booth at the Denver Comic Con. And uh, as of um, last month, he uh, has written three of his own zombie comics now. So uh, I like to you know, think that this book has kind of helped him get over the fears of at least my artwork and, uh, and you know, maybe help to pave the uh, uh, way to, you know, him finding a creative voice as well as, as a creator himself. You know, I don't know too many five- or six-year-olds that uh, are pro- professional comic artists, but uh, I guess since he's uh, been able to sell his own book, uh, I guess that's the definition of being a professional, huh? <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. Congratulations. Uh, extended to him. Wow, yeah. He's going to carry the torch. <laughs> I guess I could, you know, can't help it. I mean, granted, he is... He's constantly exposed to what I do, so uh, you know he always sees me drawing. But uh, you know, as a, a longtime instructor, you know, I can't help uh, uh, you know teach him a few uh, tricks of the trade, so to speak. So uh, I guess it was only natural to think that he was going to be creating his own uh, books. And, and you know, for uh, to be completely honest, most of the books that he illustrated were what I would describe as more um, children's picture books as well. But, uh, you know, no matter how many comics he sees me draw, you know, he he hasn't really had the, the patience to draw them, at least while we've been at home. But, uh, you know, um, ever since he started going to elementary school and uh, he's been a part of an after-school program, he's been seeing some of the, uh, the older kids in his elementary school drawing comics now all of a sudden a lot of his stories are in panels and things like that so i'm like well hey you know i'm the one that is supposed to be teaching this to you but uh you know i suppose kids only uh listen to their parents when they want to huh <laughs> that's absolutely correct well, believe me i i'm a parent myself and uh it's tough especially when they get older <laughs> how, how old are your kids oh. I still call him a kid. He's twenty one. I still call him a oh, kid. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so you've you've you know had to go through all the teen years and all the things that uh, I've I've got all these paranoias in my mind. I, I think you know a lot of the the seeds for you know what inspires me in my work comes from just me, you know, envisioning scenarios and and a lot of times it's worst case scenarios, which you know. When I'm talking to my wife, it's probably not the healthiest thing. She doesn't really like me, um, you know, having discussions the way I do with her. I, I think I kind of do it on purpose just to torture her because I like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, you know, I, I also teach my students that some of the, some of the best writers, you know, they their job is to, you know, to torture their protagonists, you know, like with your Harry Potter you know, no matter how many, um, you know, things Harry uh, solves, you know, Voldemort's coming, you know, they're going to have to fight and, you know, people are still going to blame him and other kids are going to hate him. And, you know, but that was, uh, you know, their job. They they were supposed to torture him. <laughs> He's the protagonist, you know. <laughs> so, so that's how I uh, teach uh, teach my students to write their stories as well. Exactly. Yeah, I agree because that's what makes a, a story uh, more intriguing. If the more conflict the protagonist has, if you make the protagonist too strong, it doesn't make the story interesting. Right. Right. Which is, you know, one of the things that I think makes uh, you know a character like Superman so intriguing because he's essentially invincible. So, you know, I think that uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster uh, really had this huge challenge to create some interesting stories for someone that seems so invincible. <laughs> right, right. I think it was way easier for, you know, Stan Lee with uh, Spider-Man, you know, he's like in every, every person's character, you know, that's got uh, everyday problems, you know, making money, trying to protect his aunt, you know, things like that, things that we can relate to a little bit better, I think. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, in my opinion, after reading uh, There's a Zombie in the Basement, and you did touch up on this uh, in, uh, 
in your statement. I think the story does serve as a kid-friendly medium to do, introduce kids to horror. And I think you did touch base on that. Uh, is this the goal that you had set in mind from the beginning while creating this story? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of looked back at uh, what my influences were. And granted, this, this story was definitely a, a spur-of-the-moment project. It wasn't something I'd been sitting on that I've been trying to work on for a long time. You know, with the seed of inspiration from my son, I um, all of a sudden everything got pushed to the side and, and I had to work on this right now. Um, and so a lot of my influences growing up started to, um, you know, really flood into my work. So, you know, Dr. Seuss was always a favorite of mine. That's why you have all the rhyming going on in there. Um, honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't keep the rhyming out of the story. And then the other thing that, uh, you know, I, I remember growing up that was um, highly influential was uh, uh, Where the Wild Things Are. And to me, I mean, that, that was a book that if you were to, to look at uh, the book in the library, my name was on the, the checkout card all the way down. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just check it out over and over and over again. And the thing that fascinated me about that story was that the monsters were kind of creepy, but uh, Max, the hero, um, he has control of them by the end of the story, you know, and they are all looking up to him, and uh, so they, they're no longer scary or mysterious anymore, and that's really what I had um, aimed to accomplish with this book, is take some images that are memorable and a little bit unsettling, and then um, tried to make them not as scary anymore as um, you know, the parents in the story finally decide instead of antagonizing their child, they're going to play along with his imagination. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but every time a monster shows up, I had uh, rendered the artwork in the monochromatic green. But to me, that was like a color theme for what's going on in his imagination. And all the other colors just reflected, uh, you know, what, what's in reality. So even in, on the pages where you've got like a split image where you, you see the basement and the zombie down there and then upstairs, you know, Milo is, is peering over the edge of his bed. It's green in the basement and then it's, you know, all the other colors above the cross-section of the floor and everything like that. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, children realize that, uh, you know, all of these scary things are, are just figments of his imagination. I gotta look, in, look at the book diff, uh, from that perspective. I don't think I noticed that one. It gives a different perspective of his reality and, uh, and, and his imagination. I think there's only one page where I kind of diverge from that, where it's um, uh, he's, he's thinking about how he's going to be in the morning if he uh, doesn't get some sleep. And he's uh, outside of the principal's office, but that wasn't something that he was, as, you know, particularly scared of. So it was still monochromatic, so still in his in his mind. Um, and then I think later on in the story, um, I have uh, what looks like a My Little Pony riding on the shoulders of a, a French mime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that, that, that was a, a little diversion as well, just because they mentioned that the pony is pink colored and. Uh, um, so, you know, through the Society of Children's Book Writers, I, I hooked up with a, uh, uh, a local critique group of um, children's book uh, writer illustrators, and uh, uh, I kind of took a vote because uh, I, I liked visually how the, the pony looked being pink, you know, being different than all the monochromatic green, and uh, the vote came out that uh, almost everyone else liked uh, the pink pony better as well, so I just left it pink. <laughs> wow. A little tweak like that, you'd be surprised you know, how, how much uh, feedback it would get. It's the littlest detail. And, and I, you know, I had to sneak a pony in there somewhere, because at, at these conventions, I, I do zombie characters, and I do My Little Pony characters. So I have this banner that says ponies versus zombies, where I've got uh, characters of ponies squaring off against uh, celebrity characters of, of zombies. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of fun to, you know, talk to people about it as they're walking by. Would you like to be drawn as a pony, a uh, zombie, 
or a My Little Pony. And, you know, if nothing else, it'll make people do a double take because it's like two incongruent things that uh, um, makes them curious. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I didn't notice uh, in your uh, Instagram page. Like, okay, uh, scrolling down, I see all these uh, zombies all of a sudden. My little pony, anyway, kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have all these mashups as well. So if you go to my website mm -hmm. um, on the Prince page, and, and I have like a, a, a gallery of uh, a lot of my uh, sketch covers and things like that, I try to do crossovers. So like I, I do um, like the Walking Dead characters as uh, my little pony inspired characters and we'll do them like I've got Daryl and uh, Beth um, on the cover of a, a, a My Little Pony sketch cover um, a scene where they're you know um, I don't know if you remember a couple of seasons back uh, she's going to drink peach snot to her yes. you know, 21st birthday <laughs> yes, yes, yes. and so that was my alternate story where they, they actually drank it and then they turned into My Little Pony <laughs> wow, that, that must have been some very hard moonshine. <laughs> um, good uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, he, he smashed the bottle, so they, they averted that. Uh... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, given that the uh, given that the there's a zombie in the basement does help kids uh, relate more to the horror genre. Um, in comparison to our generation growing up and um, now, do you see a big difference in how this book would be beneficial uh, for kids today? You know, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and, and things were uh, really a lot different for us. I mean, I, I, to be honest with all the things that uh, they do to protect kids and that parents get turned into child protective services where I am surprised we survived our, our childhood. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> but, you know, I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of glad that society has turned in, in that direction because I'm already just naturally paranoid to begin with. And, and like I said, you know, that's how I, I write my stories and things like that. Just my vivid imaginations of worst case scenarios and things like that. So, I mean, I, I know that, uh, uh, a lot of parents probably don't uh, share, um, you know, my my opinions or, or my personality, but, uh, um, you know, Misery Loves Company, and I was going to be that way as a parent anyway, <laughs> so um, I'm glad that everyone else has to be that way, too, <laughs> that way I don't feel alone. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know, I mean... I think every child is, is very different from one another. I mean, all these years, uh, this past decade of drawing zombie characters of people, I've been honestly really surprised by um, how many young, young children uh, that have sat for me that I've drawn that I'll sit there and I'll, I'll actually, they'll be talking to me about uh, episodes of The Walking Dead and we kind of geek out about it. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, you are too young to be watching that show. I mean, in, in my opinion, The Walking Dead, you know, with the exception of the, um, you know, lack of real nudity and uh, uh, the profanity that you'll, you know, have in a rated R movie, it's it's more brutal than almost any zombie movie I've ever seen, you know, just from a special effects standpoint and a situational standpoint. Um you know, the character relationships make things just that much more impactful because instead of just, you know, watching it for two hours, you've had seasons and seasons of backstory behind these characters. So when bad things happen to them, um, you know, it just hits you that much harder. And uh, um, so, you know, for me, um, it, th there's probably, I mean, it, it's, 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 uh, um, it's so, so much more extreme than any zombie movie I've seen. So to have kids um, that are, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't let my child watch The Walking Dead at least for another seven or eight years <laughs> from where he is right now. But we'll see how things develop. I mean, like I said, that he's, he's starting to, um, you know, draw his own zombie comics. And, and granted, uh, he has,
hasn't completely overcome his fear of everything. Um, the funny thing is he, he grew up uh, being uh, a huge, huge fan and, of uh, the movie Cars. But then um, earlier this year, he started being afraid of all of his, uh, his Cars toys and paraphernalia posters because he thought that Lightning McQueen's eyes were following him. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, then he's, like, really fascinated by other scary things. Like, right now, his, his big uh, um, obsession is Ghostbusters. Uh, now, we even let him see the most recent movie because it's PG-13. And uh, we've let him watch the original Ghostbusters movie. And he's watched the, uh, uh, you know, the real Ghostbusters cartoon. And he's got a DVD of that. But we still fast forward to a few things, I think. Mostly, uh, some of the things that uh, maybe you know banter between uh, Sigourney Weaver and, and uh, Bill Murray's characters, <laughs> things mm-hmm. like that, or things that you know my wife is a little more concerned about. He doesn't need to be repeating those lines because he's uh, turning into uh, uh, a good geek, you know, reciting lines from things that he's passionate about. So we don't need him reciting a few of those other lines. Exactly, I understand fully. They become like uh, portable recorders. At the yeah, he's a most parent, for awkward sure. moment, they'll just blurt it out. <laughs> I I have problems. I mean, as it gets older and older, I mean, I've, I've been proud of myself that I've been able to filter my uh, dirty language and things like that. But I don't know. I think there's like something in the back of my mind that forces me to push the envelope a little bit and. Uh, you know, I love double meanings, double entendres, hence, you know, my comic book series, The Wang, which is, uh, you know, my main character's last name, but it's also, you know, a double entendre for the whole book, where, you know, for all intents and purposes, uh, a battery-operated adult toy is kind of a character in the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my career has obviously took, taken a, a big left turn from, you know, my early influences of, uh, you know, the alternative underground comics. But uh, when I started, you know, reading comics in earnest, you know, my, my you know, biggest influences were the uh, R. Crumbs and Bob Fingermans and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the, the stuff that really is definitely not aimed uh towards kid, uh, you know, children, <laughs> right, right, right. but, uh, but I, I can safely say that, uh, you know, my son has provided me with, uh, endless amount of, um, uh, inspiration. So even going forward, a lot of the monsters that I've included in this book, I've got all these, you know, backstories now for these, these monsters and, uh, so, and, and I've had fun actually reading my son, um, like middle grade novels and middle grade graphic novels that kind of bridge the gap between us. So even though they're more difficult uh, reading level than he is used to, um, uh, he enjoys the stories as much as I do. I mean, just equally. And uh, so um, I think going forward, and, and plus, you know, as, as fun as it was to create this picture book, you know, my, my soul and my muse is in the comic genre. So, I mean, going forward, I'm, I'm going to be creating some uh, middle grade graphic novels featuring some of these uh, monsters as uh, the protagonists um, in, uh, in, uh, in different universes. <laughs> cool. cool. Definitely something to look forward to. Um, then, um, last couple of questions. Um, you are an instructor. Uh, what field of uh, comic book illustration or dialogue uh, do you teach your students? Um, comics and cartooning and some basic illustration as well. Um, I actually started, uh, you know, back in, I think it was 2007. My, my mentor, uh, Tom Motley, who actually now uh, instructs um, comics and, and graphic uh graphic arts out uh, in New York um, at the School of Visual Arts and at the Pratt Institute. He, uh, he had planned on moving out there just to see if he could, uh, you know, move his career forward.
board. He, he felt like things had kind of uh, stalled out, and he, he had gone as far as he could go here in Denver. So he actually trained me to take over a lot of the uh, children's summer camps that he'd been teaching around town. So that's where I first started teaching. And then, um, you know, as reluctant as I was to join social media, um, you know, one uh, one winter, um, I was trying to organize my uh, father's 70th birthday party, and, and so many of my cousins were on Facebook. I went ahead and said, okay, I'll go ahead and join Facebook just as a way of, you know, getting a hold of them, you know, to try to get this party together. And two days after I, uh, I, I signed up, and, you know, 300 friends later, um, I got a job offer to uh, teach a brand new um, uh, graphic storytelling program at uh, the local community college here in Aurora, Colorado. And I was like, well, yeah, I'll totally do that because I, I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm so limited just because of uh, the children's literacy levels, you know, depending on what age they were and the fact that I only have them for, you know, one 15-hour week. Uh, how far I could take them and, uh, you know, teaching adults that, you know, theoretically were paying their own tuition to take my class, you know, I'd be able to do a lot more for, uh, for people that were, you know, hopefully at least partially as passionate about the medium as I was. And, uh, so I, I jumped at the opportunity and taught there for a few years before, unfortunately, my boss who launched the program, moved on to a different school and uh and then you know under new leadership everything kind of sizzled from there oh, wow, <laughs> so, so I've, I've continued to teach more on a, you know an individual level so I, I i started getting back a little bit into uh, uh teaching a, a couple of weekly summer camps over the summer but i also figured out that it was it was holding back my career just because i couldn't travel to as many of the conventions as I'd wanted to and, and do some of the, you know, lucrative caricature gigs um, that I otherwise would be able to do more of, you know, because that's when a lot of people have weddings over the summer and things like that, that you get hired on to do caricatures for. And then, um, um, I don't even know where I was going with this. <laughs> oh, I'm teaching, yes. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, I've kind of taken what I've learned as a teacher into doing school appearances. Um, so I've already started promoting There's a Zombie in the Basement, uh, going to uh, elementary schools to uh, do reading, talk a little bit about my unusual career path and, and getting to where I am to create this book. And then also teaching um, kids how to, uh, um, I do a monster drawing workshop because, you know, as you noticed on the last page of my book, there's a page that says, what are you scared of? Draw a picture of it here. So in my um, visit kit, um, teachers can can download a packet that includes that last page. So before I come and visit, the kids can, you know, prepare for my uh, visit by um, drawing their own monsters and things that they're scared of. And so when I show up, actually uh, ask the kids what they drew, incorporate three of their ideas into kind of a mashup monster that is not scary. So that's my challenge. So, But the, the other thing that I'm trying to teach them is how I'm using simple geometric shapes to create a character design um, that you can draw over and over again to tell a story. Because you know, if you're going to be telling a story, uh, you'll probably have to draw your protagonist more than once <laughs> doing different things and, and whatnot. So um, I try to combine all of those things into uh, a drawing workshop um, that'll help the kids. So if they end up you know, buying a copy of my book and, and drawing on the last page, they can recreate you know, what they were trying to draw uh, with a little bit more education um, on how to draw it uh, under their belts, you know. And, uh, so, and that's something that, you know, I can do in person or, you know, I can do via Skype if necessary if, uh, you know, because I know that not all schools have the budget to fly me out and things like that. <laughs> so, no, 
and I say, hey, you gotta take care, take advantage of this technology while it's still there. Yep, yep, absolutely. And uh, last, it's not a question, but it's just an open platform and how uh, consumers can purchase. Uh, there's a zombie in the basement. Where could they go? How much does it cost? Well, probably the easiest thing to do is just to go to my website, uh, which is stanyan.me, S-T-A-N-Y-A-N dot M-E. And then um, I think one of the first banners that pops up is, uh, so there's a zombie in the basement. They can click on that and uh, get to um, a purchase page, I think, just one more click away. Uh, it's fourteen ninety five plus shipping. Um, it's also available on Amazon as well. So uh, for those of you that uh, have Amazon gift cards and don't know what to do with them or whatever, you can purchase it there. Um, and uh, I know that there are uh, some retailers online that uh, have uh, have been carrying the book as well. So um, I think some of the ones that I noticed uh, you can order through Barnes & Noble's website um, uh, through, I think Goodreads even has a, a mechanism to purchase it, a book depository, a books, wordery, indie bound. Unfortunately, most of those sites won't get you a signed copy, so if you order it through my website, I'll send you an email and you know ask you if you'd like a personalized uh, autograph of the book or something like that. And then, uh, um, and then there's a bunch of uh, local retailers here in uh, Denver that are also carrying the book, um, and those are all signed books as well. But you can go to my website if you're anywhere in the uh, Denver metro area to see where they are so far, and then hopefully I'll be able to get some signed copies out to uh, stores outside of the state of Colorado before too long, too. Thank you for this uh, interview and these very good insights and a lot of topics we have covered, um, just not only on your book, but in horror and your career in general. Well, thanks for uh, having interest in us and uh, getting an interview with me, Ken. <laughs> not a problem. And best of luck, well wishes to you and your, your career, and do definitely look forward to uh, seeing some of your stuff definitely opened my eyes and uh, I'll be looking at uh, you know visiting your website and checking out some other your other stuff that you had mentioned oh well great I, I appreciate that and uh, you know hopefully the next time you hear about me uh, you know things will have taken off but I don't know I think my son's career trajectory is actually going up even faster than mine so maybe I'll just uh, leech off of his success instead <laughs> <laughs> You could be my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> you could be the agents. <laughs>